Good evening. I hope that you've been able to stay up on, on the book, uh, the second one, or this would be number three. Bible's number one, Psalm book's number two, so this would be number three, so if you're counting. Uh, but hopefully you've been able to follow. We are in chapter five, and uh, we're beginning a new section of this. As you remember, uh, this is almost broken out over these 13 chapters. We're actually looking at 12, because we combined a couple earlier. But we looked the first, uh, the first four chapters uh, with this was the attitude of the encourager. And uh, we looked at purpose and we looked at some of the, the things that go into having courage and fighting discouragement. As we step into chapter five, this section is five chapters. So it's going to be today and then it's going to go for the next four Wednesday nights in October. But this is uh, what Aubrey Johnson calls the anatomy of an encourager. Now, when you think of the word anatomy, what comes to your mind? Your body. It's, and, and that's exactly what he does. He's looking, and, and, that's, and our focus tonight is going to be the mind. He, he looks at the anatomy of the person. What is, what's going on in your mind, encourager? What's going on inside your head? This is such an incredible chapter. If you have not read this, I'm actually going to, want to take several chunks of this and read it together with you because it is so valuable that we catch this. And I really wish, and I mentioned this to Logan and to Doug early in the week, I, this is something I think our kids need to hear. I really do. Because we're talking about what are you thinking about? And you know good and well our kids need to be challenged on what they're thinking about. We have such an incredible task ahead of us with the way culture has taken our technology and made it a struggle. We've really got to help our kids understand you've got to think about what's going into your head. And that's what this is going to focus on. We're going to look at the eyes. We're going to look at the ears. We're going to look at the mouth. We're going to look at the hands. As we go through the anatomy, actually, as I first, when I first did this class, I think it was back in, in 2012 at Waterview, one of the things that I did with this section is I called it the VBS song, Oh, Be Careful, Little Hands, What You Do. Do you remember that song? Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. Oh, be careful, little mouth, what you say. And that's really what we're talking about here. It's the anatomy of the encourager. What is he, what is he doing? And we're looking right now for this, for this evening at your mind. And what are you putting into your mind? That's going to be our focus. Uh, real quickly, before we hop into chapter 5, uh, you know this week has been, or this, uh, this quarter uh, has a homework assignment. And I've given you some homeworks every, uh, homework every evening. Uh, we've talked about the traits and to look for, uh, think about what are the traits of an encourager. I also want you to make a list of people you thought who needed encouragement. Hopefully you're checking these off every week as we go through these. Uh, uh, two weeks ago we talked about when do Christians need encouragement? When do our brothers and sisters need encouragement? And then last week, if you remember, we asked, uh, I encourage you to encourage your child to find one of the young folks and encourage them and hopefully... Hopefully you're able to do this. A lot of folks say, you know, I, this, I'm not in school anymore. Why are you giving me a homework assignment? Uh, do I have to do it? And you know the answer. Of course you don't have to do it. This is, uh, this is, there's no assignment. You don't have to turn in a piece of paper with your name on the top and the date and all that stuff. But should you do it? Ladies and gentlemen, I would say just do it. Be an encourager. Because you're either going to be an encourager or you're going to be a discourager. And I say that because if I'm not encouraging, do you know what I'm doing? I'm not encouraging. And if I'm not encouraging, I'm leaving a void. And that void, as we've talked about already, can be discouragement. So let's go ahead and start digging into the mind of the encourager. Um, as you looked at, uh, if you've been looking at this, I thought he really had some critical things to say. I want you to hear some of this, and we're going to dig into the text in a moment. But in the very first chapter, I mean, in the very first paragraph of chapter 5, he talks about the, that our physical health, based on research, our physical health can be affected by our mental health. What we think about can affect our, affect our bodies. Disease and health are often rooted in thought. Fear and anxiety cause numerous digestive and circulatory problems. If you didn't know that to be the case, if you thought, well, that's, that's just all hocus pocus. No, ladies and gentlemen, that's truth. Have you ever heard of stress? When we have stress in our life, that can affect us physically. And, um, and, and this, is, this is part of what he, he's trying to get. Guilt can shatter the nervous system. Think about how you feel when you're, when you're harboring guilt. Yet thought can also affect health in a positive way. Cheerful thoughts can embrace the body's natural healing 
capacities. And even Solomon talks about a cheerful heart is healing to the bones. So we can catch the scripture with that. But the mind is so critical. What are we putting in to our mind can affect us. And really, the, this, the, the th same thing goes for our bodies. And you know that to be the case. Do I eat some more of this cake? <laughs> it's really good. Or should I go back for salad? Now, for some people, like my wife, that's not even a problem. Give her the, the salad all day long. She doesn't need the cake. I kind of like the cake. But she did surprise me last night. After supper, she said, you want a piece of chocolate cake? And so that was kind of a nice thing. But the salad or the cake, what you put into your body is going to give you either nourishment or it's just going to be good for us. Let's take a, let's take a look at, not good for us, but enjoyable for us. Take your Bibles and turn to Mark chapter 17. I want us to look at a passage here where Christ is actually speaking to his disciples. And we're going we're gonna to read through this because this, uh, this is important for us to get. And, and Aubrey talks a lot about this in chapter 5. His disciples had a hard time grasping this. The Jewish culture had a hard time grasping this. Because you know there are some things within the Jewish culture, if you eat them, you become what? Unclean. Ceremonially unclean. You cannot eat that. Don't touch it. And that's the old law. And they understood that to be the case. Well, you know from the, Pharisee, the study of the Pharisees that they, they put traditions on top of this. But listen to what Jesus says when it comes to the eating, the stomach, and the thinking, the mind. Verse 14 of chapter 7. After he, Jesus called the crowd to him again, he began saying to them, listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside the man which can defile him if it goes into him. But the thing which proceeds out of the man or what defile the man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Verse 17. When he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples questioned about this parable. I'm still not catching it. I don't understand, Lord, what you're saying. And he said to them, verse 18, Are you so lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand that whatever goes into a man from outside cannot defile him? He's talking about the food. Because it does not go into his heart, but into his stomach, and then it's eliminated. Thus he declared all foods clean. Verse 20, And he was saying, that which proceeds out of the man, that is what defiles the man. What comes out, it's kind of like the adage we used to say with computers. Garbage in, garbage out. For from within, out of the heart of man, proceed the evil thoughts, fornication, thefts, murder, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and, and foolishness. Verse 25, 4, 3, I'm sorry. All these evil things pr proceed from within and defile the man. What Christ is saying is what you, what you take into your heart, what you take into your mind, what you spend time thinking about, ladies and gentlemen, that's what's going to come out. And you know that to be the case. When you hear someone who behaves in such a way verbally that's atrocious, that stuff just doesn't happen. That's because I've spent time either listening or indulging or participating in activities that defile me. You see, it's our mind, and we've got to, we've got to keep that in mind protected. Philippians chapter 4, let's turn over there real quick. I want you to catch what Paul is saying to the church in Philippi. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians chapter 4, we're looking at verse 6. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplications, which with thanksgiving let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Then look at verse 8. I love verse 8. Verse 8 is probably one of my favorite verses uh, in the scripture. But I want us to catch something. This is what Paul is telling us to do. He said, finally, after understanding this, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is just and pure and lovely and of good report, whatever is of virtue and of praiseworthy. What does Paul tell us to do with that stuff? Dwell on it. Think on it. That's what we should be, that's what we should be thinking about. Ladies and gentlemen, this world does not hold these virtues. This, the world does not espouse purity. This world does not espouse 
a good report or being virtuous. We have to look at what are we doing putting into our head the things of this world that do not give us the things of God. So when I think about this, when I think about what he says, whatever is a good report, Whatever is true, whatever is honorable and right and pure, all of these things, he says, think on these things or let your mind dwell on these things. When I first came across this, it's, it's a great passage, and I love it, and I, and I pick it up, but I really noticed it, and I really grabbed a hold of it whenever I got into college. Because we had, I was in uh, an a cappella chorus with Dr. Wayne Hines, I don't know if that rings a bell for, for any, any of you, if you were ever associated with Lubbock Christian back in the day. But we sang a song that actually used those, that passage, Philippians 4, verse 8. But the writer of the song then took and added Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7. And I want you to hear what Proverbs chapter 20, 23, verse 7 says. For as a man thinketh in his heart, that's what he is. That's what Solomon said. The wisest man said, what you think about, that's what you're going to, that's why we should think on things that are pure and things that are a good report, because what you're thinking about is what you will be. That seems really basic. Now stay with me on this. That seems really basic. And we can check that list and say, yes, I've got that. But why is that so hard to do? And I'm looking for comments here. Why is it so hard for us to think on those things, knowing that what we think, because, and I'll tell you this, and you know it, it's a lot easier to sit down and turn on the television and watch the, watch the sitcom for a little bit, where they're cussing at each other, or they're talking about living together, or they're talking about uh, 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 scenes of inappropriate behavior for a Christian. Why is it so easy to do that, but so hard to think on these things? Why is it? Does anyone have an answer for me or a recommendation for me? Suggestion. I'm opening the door. Things in pretty packages. That's exactly right what he does. So what do we do? Just heard two different reasons, and they're both exactly right. One of them, the devil packages things that looks really good. It's kind of like that, that, that fish that's swimming through the water, and he sees that lure that flashes, and ooh, what is this? And it dra- grabs our eye. And, remind me again, <laughs> I, got, I just got earnest. Eyes off the prize. We take our eyes off of what we know we're supposed to be doing. And it may not even be, it may not even be that I'm lured by it and I want to chase it. It may be I'm just distracted by it. It, it may be that I'm, I'm scared. I don't know how to handle this. It may be I, I, I'm not sure how to, to, to deal with this one. When we let ourselves, when we lose courage to hold fast to this, ladies and gentlemen, the distraction is exactly what the devil wants. And, and, and I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. But when we sit and we find ourselves working here and spending more time on this than we do with our families, with our own children, when our children are so engaged right here that we're, do you see why I want our kids to be a part of this? When our kids become so engaged with the, the distractions, the packages, the things that happen around us that we miss what God has given to us, and there's some good things we can get from technology. I'm not, I'm not trying to rain on all, all over that. But when we let it pull us away from God and what was right, when we start letting our minds think on things that are not wholesome, that are not pure, ladies, it is not an easy thing that just happens. Yes, sir actually seen my slides because we're going to have something alluding to that in just a moment. But you're right. If we, it, it is on a comical level. But when we realize the struggle and the battle is, it's real. And, and are we going to face this battle and overcome? Or are we going to face this battle and, well, I'm, I'm okay. I'm really not a bad person. I don't, I don't kill anybody. I, I, don't, I don't commit adultery. I'm not stealing. I'm not cheating on my taxes. I'm a good person. Do I follow what, do I encourage and love my brothers and sisters like I ought to? Well, yeah, no. I got other things to do. I got to work in the garden. Or I got to get home and get the house cleaned. 
or I haven't been on the lake in a long time, I need to treat myself. Do you see what I'm saying? When we focus on things that, that distract us, things that look a lot better than what maybe we would like to be doing, that's when we gotta, that's when we gotta be, be careful and cautious because the devil is after us. When it comes to our thinking, ladies and gentlemen, you need to understand this. Thoughts are like seeds. When you plant a seed, you know exactly what you're planting. This is a corn seed. This is sunflower seed. This is okra seed. And I know when I plant that, I have to be very intentional about it because I know I'm going to be getting that, right? How many of you plant weeds in your gardens? Why don't you plant weeds? Why don't you go out and get some dandelions and take that little fluffy white dandelion and spread that out so you can get them? Why don't you do that? Because you don't have to. That stuff just happens. That just happens. And you, but you've got to be intentional to eradicate it and get it out. If you don't, you know that will take over. So when I think about my mind and I think about what I'm thinking about as a garden, and actually if you're reading, if you've read this, you're going to know that Aubrey Johnson references a book. It's a secular book by James Allen. It's called As a Man Thinketh. And Aubrey Johnson's uh, opinion is this is probably one of the best uh, non-inspired books. And he may very well be right because a lot of the things that he says are so apropos for us. Um, a good character is not the product of chance. Good character is not a product. Well, it just happens. He just, he's just a good person. It's more than a beautiful, any more than a beautiful garden can just happen by chance. You know, when you think about your garden, and if you were to see and look at this in someone's yard, or maybe this is your yard, does that just happen? Oh, I throw that stuff out, and look what happened. There's my garden. I can guarantee you that takes work. It takes long hours getting the weeds out, cultivating it, making sure it's watered. Now, that may look like, like some of your gardens, and if that's the case, that means you're intentional with it. Because, ladies and gentlemen, you know good and well that those don't need any help coming up. The same goes with our thoughts. I have to be intentional about what I'm planting in my mind. I have to think about what am I going to dwell on because the negative thoughts will happen easy, easy. That's what the devil does to us. So let's take this same idea, this, this mind being a garden, and let's dig on this a little bit. Just as plants come from seeds, actions grow from our thoughts. Are you aware of that? Just like Plants will come from a little seed. The things that we do begin with our thoughts. I like the, uh, the analogy, and if you're in education, you know this. Uh, when you consider the word kindergarten, does anyone know where that comes from? It's German by origin, and it means a garden for children. This is where you start to get those little, gar those little plants, those li and you start, you start preparing them and, har and getting ready for a harvest one day. And you start planting in their minds the academics, the educational pieces in the kinder, in the children's garden, the kindergarten. When we understand that, then we understand our responsibility as dads and as moms. But I'm going to hone on the dads for a second. Because dads and granddads, you've got an enormous responsibility. If, you're, if your children are no longer here, because like Vicky and I, our, our children are now the ones who are looking over the little ones instead of being the little ones. But now as grandparents, that's us looking down on the grandkids. Do we have a responsibility and obligation? Absolutely, without a doubt, because we are going to be able to nurture them and bring them along to the understanding of what they need to be doing and where they need to be living. And we can only do that, ladies and gentlemen, when we know what to plant in their hearts and their minds. That's why when we see so many people struggling in this world and we go, if they only knew Christ, if they only knew the family of God, stay with me on this because I'm going to get a little tough. If they only knew what we had, their life could be so much better. And this is a truism. You know this. But do we remember this? This book. It, it, the, the thoughts are the beginning process that gets us to the actions, that gets us ultimately to, ultimately to our destination. Where do you want to be? Ladies and gentlemen, it starts 
with the planting of thoughts. It starts on where you start to put your, 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 in your mind. And, I, and I'll read this again. If you want to follow in the book, it's uh, page uh, 59, and it's about the second paragraph down, the second full paragraph. The overarching theme of as a man thinketh is that individuals control the development of their character through controlling their thoughts. You control your character by controlling what you're thinking about. At the very moment he cho one chooses his thoughts, he also chooses his destiny. When you start to think about what you're going to, what's going to go into your, your heart and your mind, that's when you start to establish where you're going to be going, where your destiny is going to lie. Allen's garden analogy well illustrates this cause and effect relationship. And then I underline this, and if you're following, this is one that you may want to put a pin to. Just as plants come from seeds, actions grow from thoughts. The challenging part is getting the right seeds into the garden of your mind. You see, weeds will come, out with, will come up without any problem. The negative thinking, the destructive thoughts, that doesn't take a whole lot of cultivating. But we do have to be prepared to eradicate those. And just like you would pull a dandelion, just like you would dig down to get the root of that dandelion because it shoots a long tap root, we have to sometimes be very dil diligent, especially if I let it grow. Now, if a dandelion's early on or any weed is early on, can you take care of that pretty quick? Sure you can. And when we're disciplining our kids, that comes in the form of a paddling or a timeout or something that lets them know this weed is not going to stay here. And I think you're getting my point here. If I let that weed grow, if I let that negative thought grow, what will it do? It will send a root that is hard, hard to get out. And I might even pull it up. And if you've ever done a dandelion like this, you know you pull it up and you might break off the end of that tap root. Guess what that's going to do? I'm sorry? Without a doubt, it will come right back up. That's why we have to do this when our kids are little. And what it might mean it might mean I'm going to guard them and protect them from some things that they ought not to be watching or seeing. And if, and if a parent takes in, I know, I'm talking to, I know I'm talking to the choir. I know I'm preaching to people that understand this already. But if we're sitting there watching some things that we ought not to be watching and our kids are close by and we're having to shield their eyes, those kids aren't stupid. They're saying there's something that's not good with this. And I wonder what that is. And they will explore. So ladies and gentlemen, what we got to do is we got to make sure we shut that off. And I'm speaking now to myself. Now a lot of what Vicky and I have done, we can't go back and change. So we, we go forward from here. And you may be in that spot. I want to give you a quick little formula what, what, what I have found. In visiting with people and even in my own life, when you have situations where your kids, after they've gotten past the point of discipline, and how do I correct this? And what do I do with this? The only thing that you might have left at your disposal is obviously prayer. That goes without being said. But the only thing you might have left to do is to, is to apologize and say, I'm sorry. If I did some things, which I must have if you've chosen this way, if I've done anything that's, well, it's kind of like that song, if I have wounded any soul today, if I have caused one foot to go astray, if I've walked in my own willful way, dear Lord, forgive. Sometimes that's where we go. If, we, if we've got children that have grown up with a garden that's got a lot of weeds in it, we might need to say, you know, I messed up on that and I let some things grow. But that doesn't mean I'm giving up on you. So when we consider the garden of the mind, we've got to make sure we take care of it. But I'll tell you, quite honestly, if we faced the weeds in our mind like we faced the weeds in our gardens we'd be very adamant about getting those weeds out. And we'd be very strong with that. That does not stay. That is not what we do. But we've got to make sure that we're, that we're consistent with it. If I say it to my kids, this is the way we're going to, or my grandkids, this is what you need to do, but yet I turn around and do this, they're going to say, wait a minute, that makes no sense. You're really aggressive with me about these weeds, but you've got some weeds that don't seem to bother you. What's going on with that? That double-mindedness, that, uh, that con contradiction will really give us, give us tr troubles. So as we think about intentional thoughts, as we think about making sure the seeds that are going in are going to be right seeds, I want to give you some things to, 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 to dwell on, to, to pull together. 
And one of these, and I deal with this a lot through this uh, singing, with the, singing with the Spirit workshops that I do, is that's what are you listening to music-wise? What are you putting into your mind music-wise? And, and I'm telling you all this uh, un- unapologetic, unapologetically. If you're listening to things of the world music-wise that clash and counter what you sing on Sunday morning, you're starting to sow some seeds that might be con- controversial. It might be, well, why do we listen to country western songs about, uh, about uh, cheating and stealing and drinking, and then I come to church, and that's not at all what we listen to on Sunday, uh, on, during the weekday. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got to rethink what we, think, what we listen to because that goes into our heads, and it goes into our hearts, and that sows seed. Now, I'm not saying all country western's bad. There's, there's some, I tell you, from the 80s, and, if you, and you know what I'm talking about, though, if you went, there's some of the, from that time period that was not good at all, and I listened to some of that stuff, and there took a lot of eradicating. I still have to do that. My wife will cuff me every now and again. But I'm trying to make sure the music that I put into my head now is good a cappella singing because I want to be able to have seeds that are positive, things you watch on television. I, I'm going to tell on myself real quick. We used to love to watch... Um, Everybody Loves Raymond. Did you all ever see that one? Did you ever see Everybody Loves Raymond? Okay, some are going to admit it. Thank you for admitting it. <laughs> some of you are not, but that's what, maybe you don't. But we used to watch that, and it was kind of fun to watch how they would kind of go back and forth. But we noticed as the season progressed, as the, as the seasons progressed, they got really mean and aggressive and loud. And we started thinking, that's not what we want to listen to. That's not what we want to watch. We, wanted, we had to guard ourselves against that on a person. But you have to do that for yourself. Overall, you've got to realize that your intentional thinking is actually intentional living. And I love what he says about this. I'm going to see if I can find his quote uh, with this one. Um, yes. He says, never underestimate the power of thought. This is Aubrey Johnson's quote. I think this is the very last page of this chapter. Uh, yep, power of thought. It's the very beginning of, the, of this last paragraph. Careless, indolent people see success as a lucky break. Now listen to what he's saying there. When people say, see, zone has been very successful, oh, they just got lucky. That, they, they do, that, they did, that's, just, that's just the breaks. I don't get the breaks like that. That's what happens when, when a person is lazy and careless. But... The courageous people know differently. One person sees the result, the other person sees the process. How'd they get to be successful? What did they do? The sweat and the blood and the tears that were put in to make them this successful. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the garden. That's the thoughts that we put into our minds. You know good and well that this guy working out is not getting the job done. He's all dressed up and ready to work out, but he's not doing the things that he must be doing. We can do the same thing if I say, if I come to church and sit here and I sing and I go through all the motions and yet I go out and I live like the world does, how can I expect, how can I expect to have a garden that shows Christ? I'll recommend to you, I don't think you can. For as a man thinketh in his heart, that's the way he is. This one I thought was pretty pretty revealing. Uh, this was an area as we were, as I was going through this and, and looking at uh, looking at what he was talking about here. And this is probably more so even now than before. When you consider revealing your mind and you consider th- that social media, Facebook, what do you post? What do you say? I'm very thankful that my wife, uh, she sends me some very encouraging things. But quite frankly, Sometimes what we do with this is what used to happen years ago, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm, I'm talking before social media. When we get on the phone, oh, I got to tell you what happened. Let me tell you what's going on, and it becomes a gossip fest. It becomes a, a, a dragging through mud. We had uh, several years ago, uh, when, I was still, when we were still at Waterview, we had a small group, and I don't think I told you this, maybe I have, uh, we had a small group at, at the house, and we'd had our supper together, and, and uh, we were sitting around having a little devotional. It was probably about, oh, 20, maybe 25 folks. 
and as we were, we were going through and discussing what our lesson was, we are talking about uh, how we deal with each other. And, and one of the ladies, I'll never forget who she was and where she was sitting in the room. I was up at the front, and we were kind of spread around, and she was sitting right here to the side. And we were talking about how we, what we, what do we post? What do we put on Facebook? And I'll never forget what she said. She said, well, actually, I have two Facebook pages. One for my friends at church and one for my friends at work. And I literally said to her, and I didn't mean to be mean. I don't know if she thought I was mean or not. I said, you know, that sounds like you're a little two-faced. Because I don't want people at work to see these people, to see these people. And I don't want these people here to see these people. Ladies and gentlemen, if that's where we're going, we're living two different lives, that's still the same mind. And what we're putting in there is causing us to, it's causing us to be, one, struggled with in there, but it's the thought, it's the weeds. It's not intentional. And I'll take you to James, and this is where our reference comes before. Turn to James chapter 1, if you will, with me. And if, you, uh, if you're familiar with, with this, you're going to uh, know exactly where we're going James is talking uh, here as he's writing this letter. He's talking about our faith and, and knowing that the testing of our faith produces endurance. Uh, and that brings its uh, uh, considered joy when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And then he says in verse 4, and I'm going to pick up in verse 5, and let the endurance have its perfect results so that you may be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. Let, let those trials, let those things that... that come into your life. Let, let those help you grow, but that's only if you pull them out. That's only if you work them. If you let them stay there, you're not getting the job done, like James is saying here. But if any of you lacks wisdom, well, how do I get this figured out? Let him ask of God. If you're not sure how to get this done, you've got the, you've got the great creator who will help you, and you've got his word. He gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him, verse 6. But he must ask in faith without doubting. Why? What if I got seeds of doubt in my head? Because the one who doubts is like the surf of the wind. Surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. I don't know if this is going to happen or not, but I'll go ahead and pray it anyway. That means nothing. You've got to have the faith. Verse 7. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. If you're, if you're, if you're waffling in your, in your faith, if you're not, I don't know, I'm just kind of going through this, how do you expect God to be able to work through you? Verse 8 is the key. Don't expect to receive anything from the Lord being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Ladies and gentlemen, you know that we're going to have, there's your picture, you know we're always going to have that conflict, that, that turmoil. Should I do this or should I do that? Get rid of the weeds. Get rid of the weeds. Don't even give the devil an opportunity. And that's even scripture. Don't let the sun go down in your wrath. Don't give the devil a chance. Make sure that you, you eradicate those as you can, but don't forget it's going to be very difficult because it sure is, looks good to do that. And it's so distracting. I, I just keep getting off-centered. Well, how do you deal with that? Turn off the TV and turn on the Word. Turn off the radio. Maybe it's the talk radio. Maybe it's Fox News you got to get, let, let rest for a while. And, and start spending time in God's word. You are sowing seeds every minute of every hour of every day. What seeds are you choosing to put in your head? Now, I'm talking about you, and yet you have children and you have grandchildren. So you've got to be ever, ever conscious of that. Because you are establishing a garden for them. And so be careful about the double-minded. I told you that my wife is really good about sending me encouragements. And I could go back, and, and, and you know it's been a difficult semester already at school, but almost every day she would send me something encouraging. And this one came, uh, I think this is, the, this is actually what she sent me to. This is one of the, the pages. It was the front banner of one of the pages. And I, I just had to write down, think positive thoughts, say nice things, and do good for others. Everything comes back. You see, folks, when we start to meditate and think about things that are positive and not negative, it's easy to think about the negative. But think positively. And then say things that are positive. And then do things that are positive. And do it for other people. 
See, when we start to put these things together, we'll consider what we post. We'll consider what we say, and we'll consider what we do. There is a, an old hymn, and uh, Bill said he didn't know it. So if Bill doesn't know it, I don't think uh, White House knows it. But don't worry, we're not going to sing it. But I want you to see these words, because these words are so critical for us. These words are so important that we pick up. It was written back in the, over 100 years ago, in the early 1900s. But the words are this. Do not wait until some deed of greatness you may do. Do not wait to shed your light afar. To the many duties ever near you, now be true and brighten the corner where you are. How many remember that song? I saw a couple of heads nodding. And the chorus is brighten the corner where you are. Brighten the corner where you are. Someone far from harbor you may guide across the bar. So brighten the corner where you are. It's a song that simply says, shine your light and do good things. And ladies and gentlemen, your good things start with your mind. Your good things are what you start to meditate on and turn your heads towards. Look at verse 2 and verse 3. Just above our clouded skies that, that you may help to clear. Someone may be in the midst of a storm. There, there may be a spiritual attack on them. It's dark. And you might be able to help clear those clouds. Let not narrow self your way to bar. I love this old, this old speaking. Don't be so self-centered that you keep yourself shut up from other people. Don't let yourself, well, I don't know if I could do that. That's negative thinking. Don't let yourself talk yourself out of that. Don't let your narrow self get in the way and hinder you from brightening someone's life. Though into one heart alone may fall your song of cheer. Brighten the corner where you are. Here for all your talent, you may surely find a need. Ladies and gentlemen, we understand that we have God-given talents. And we have skills. You've got skills that I don't have. You've got skills that she doesn't have. You've got the ability to do things that she doesn't have the ability to do. When we realize that God has given us an opportunity, and we use that opportunity for other people, and you take your talent and find a need, here reflect, when you do that, you're reflecting the bright and morning star. That's actually a revelation talking about Christ. Jesus is the bright and morning star, Revelation 22, verse 6. Even from your humble hand, the bread of life may feed. From what you do, you may be able to bring life to other people. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about how you might be able to say something that takes somebody and turns a corner? You, you've probably heard the story before of, of a little boy who was leaving. I think it was in middle school age. And, and I don't know if it was fiction or if it was real. I've always heard it to be fiction. But the young middle school boy was walking, uh, was walking home and he, was, uh, he had all of his books. He had packed all of his stuff up and he was going home. And everybody just figured he's a loner and he's studying or whatever loners do that way. And uh, as he was leaving the school, he tripped and, and his stuff fell everywhere. And you know what kids do because it's middle school, junior high. They snicker. Some of them laugh out loud. Some of them walk by and kick a book as they walk by. But one kid... One kid saw compassion, and he went, and he helped him. He pulled his stuff together, and he helped him, and he said, are you okay? Checked on him. He said, yeah, yeah. And, and he said, can I help you carry some of this stuff? No, no, I'll help you. And they went down a little bit further and found out that they were close in the neighborhood, and they went together on, uh, on home, and he helped him in with all of his stuff. And then they left on. Well, they, they saw each other the next day, and they talked a little bit more, and, and a friendship began to develop with these two young boys. And it wasn't, but maybe another year or two later, that the young boy who was carrying all of his stuff confided in his friend. And he said, do you remember the day that, that, uh, that you helped me when I, when I fell with my stuff? And he said, yeah, yeah, that's when we first started getting our friendship together. He said, yeah, he said, do you remember that day? He said, you, you saved me on that day. He said, I was just helping you pick up some stuff. He said, no, you saved me on that day because I was taking all my stuff home and I was going to quit. I was going to commit suicide. I'd had enough of it. And he said, because of your hand of helping me, he said, you changed my thoughts. And I thought, I'll keep going. 
and they came back and they developed a friendship, you may brighten the corners of somebody you don't even know about yet. Don't let your narrow self, don't let your narrow thought process stop you from that. You may be able to feed somebody the bread of life. You may be able to show somebody Jesus Christ through your actions. You see, ladies and gentlemen, it all starts right here. What do you think about? What are you planting in your garden, in your mind? I, um, I really encourage you. I don't know how many have your books, but um, I really encourage you to, to read on these. Spend some time in this. Hold on to your Bible as you go through these. But I want to share this last one with you. This is the pathway to achievement. And then we're going to wrap this. It's going to be a little bit earlier wrap-up today. Thought affects health, character, and circumstance. What you think about affects your character. It affects your health and your circumstances. But when linked with purpose, it produces human achievement. When you take your thoughts and you link them with purpose, it helps you with achievement. Too many people drift through life aimlessly. I'm at the top of page 61 if you've got your book with you. Too many people drift through life aimlessly without any plans for the future. I don't know. I'm just kind of taking it day by day. And you've heard that. Maybe you've said that. I'm just taking it day by day. Lacking purpose can be as destructive as deliberate wrongdoing. Listen to what he says here. Lacking purpose, not having an objective, can be just as destructive as deliberately doing something wrong. For example, homes taken for granted will not prosper. If you treat your wife like, yeah, that's what she's supposed to do. Uh, my husband, yeah, he always takes, uh, and you, de- you take each other for granted. Ladies and gentlemen, I guarantee you, you will not be able to prosper like God intends. It takes conscious effort to build a strong marriage. You have to be cognizant of this. It doesn't just happen any more than that perfect garden growing happens. You've got to be intentional with it. That's an intentional living. You've got to treat your spouse with honor and respect and with love. You have to maybe even do some things that are hard work, like pulling weeds and changing some things. It takes conscious effort to build a strong marriage and prayerful determination to raise a child to be a decent human being. Did you hear that? It takes prayerful determination, prayerful determination to raise children to be decent human beings. If we take this life and this encouragement thing and we just kind of, I'll I'll do it when I can do it and I'll just let it happen, it will not happen. It will not happen. That's why, quite honestly, I throw out the homework assignments each week because you have to be intentional. Do you have to do them? No, it's kind of fun. But I want you to realize you've got to be intentional with this. If you just try to make it work, it'll never work. Because there'll always be something that's a prettier package. There'll always be a wave or there'll be some kind of distracting something that will throw me off track because the devil knows the minute you step towards God, he's got to do something to distract you and get you off kilter. So let me encourage you. Let me encourage you. Be intentional with your thinking. Be intentional with the thoughts that go in your mind. And be very diligent with your children and your grandchildren. Because God has given them to us for a very specific purpose. And it's not for us just to to go through the motions. But it's to build and plant a garden. So here's your homework assignment. If you're retired and you don't have a job to do, then fill in neighbor, okay? But here's what your assignment is. Encourage a coworker or a neighbor. How can you lighten the load of someone you work with? What can you do that will bring somebody a little bit closer to feeling this is a good thing? Now, if you're like Kim and Daniel and that's your your co-worker, you guys can also work on your marriage at the same time. So that's kind of a plus. So I encourage you to be looking for how can I help those around me, whether it's my neighbor or whether it's a co-worker. Let that be your assignment this week and try to work on that homework. Um, Next week, what we'll look at is the eyes of an encourager. There's so much that we can say with our eyes. There's so much we can say with our, with our facial expressions. And we're going to dig into that. If you haven't read chapter 6, you're going to want to read that. That's another strong one. Matter of fact, if you haven't started reading this book and you're just kind of letting it 
uh, go as an accompaniment with your Bible, that's good, but you'll do a lot better if you actually pick it up and open it up and read it. So let me, and I'm not picking on you, Whitney, okay? Don't get me wrong. But let me encourage you to read those and follow that. Uh, chapter 6 is going to be really good, talking about the eyes. I'm going to encourage you. We're going through the anatomy, so now we're looking at the body. Look at the mind, look at the eyes, look at the ears, the mouth, and the hands as we go through the month of October.